I want to welcome everybody to the 24th Annual Faculty Presidential Lecture, Why Music Matters, delivered by Dartmouth's Arthur R. Virgin Professor of Music, Theodore Levin. Ted is internationally recognized as one of the most important voices in ethnomusicology. His recording work has been nominated for Grammy Award, and his writing has garnered the prestigious American Society of Composers and Publishers Deems Taylor Award, once for outstanding coverage of music and once for excellence in ethnomusicology. Ted's contributions to the preservation of Central Asian culture are exceptional. He's worked with numerous foundations and intergovernmental agencies to facilitate political and social change through music. His work as senior project consultant to the Aga Khan Music Initiative and chair of the Arts and Culture Program of the Open Society Foundation, the Soros Foundation, has helped resuscitate whole musical traditions, enabling musicians all over the non-Western world to recover their cultural histories. Ted has also worked extensively with Yo-Yo Ma uh, and uh, was the first executive director and is an ongoing board member of the, the Silk Road Project. Like the project's namesake, his far-reaching career path has intersected with countless musicians, indigenous peoples, activists, and scholars throughout Central Asia, and his influence has extended well beyond that. Ted's research and fieldwork has deeply enriched the learning experience of his students, as well as the cultural awareness of the entire Dartmouth community. He's brought musicians with rare talents and instruments from the other side of the world, all the way to the middle of New Hampshire to perform. <laughs> These concerts give students the otherwise rare opportunity to hear the heartbeat of other cultures while also providing an international venue for, music, for the musicians' voices to be heard. Ted's passion for ancient musical tradition is equaled by the innovation he brings to Dartmouth's music department, creating performance laboratories and integrating the latest digital technology into his work. In this way, Ted's scholarship embodies both the college's longtime strength in the arts and our momentum to advance this strength well into the next century. I'm sorry. With the showing of a major hood acquisition, the completion of the Visual Arts Center, and the HOP's 50th anniversary all happening over the course of the next several months, Dartmouth is poised to reinforce its long-held position as a leader in the visual and performing arts. The coinciding of these three events has inspired the college to designate June 2012 to June 2013 as our Year of the Arts. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I want to especially uh, thank Michael Casey and Jeff James for leading that effort, but it's been an incredible uh, collaboration uh, across the entire institution. We're thrilled uh, for June, uh, June to come around. Um, the comprehensive nature of this campus-wide celebration would not be possible without faculty such as Ted, whose outstanding work demonstrates the critical importance of the arts across all disciplines in fostering cultural identity and connectivity. Now, Ted told us a story at lunch that for the first 22 or 23 years of his life, he was actually a wonderful performer. And then when he went uh, to that uh, cultural wasteland, Princeton, New Jersey, uh, they told him that if he were to be serious as an ethnomusicologist, he would have to give up more mundane things like actually performing. Now, the, the, great, the, the, the greatness of that story is Ted would never do that to his own students. And we would never do that here at Dartmouth College. It's my great privilege to introduce to you uh, Ted Levin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, very much for that warm introduction and Thanks to all of you for coming out to support this uh, lecture series this afternoon. I'm truly honored to have this opportunity to speak to our community today. Uh, and uh, as Jim mentioned, it's, uh, it's particularly meaningful uh, to me that I was invited to deliver the presidential faculty lecture in 2012, the year that will launch Dartmouth's Year of the Arts. Apparently, I'm only the second speaker in the 25-year history of the lecture series. I have to get my roller here. In the 25-year uh, history of this lecture series, and the first since 1989 to represent an arts department. I won't speculate on the reasons for that, uh, but I want to say again, thank you for this invitation. 
and I hope that Dartmouth will have many more years of the arts. In fact, I very much hope that every year will be in some way a year of the arts on this campus. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge President James Friedman, who initiated the presidential lecture series, and point out that his aspirations for intellectual diversity at Dartmouth, which he conveyed by quoting Thoreau's famous line from Walden about stepping to a different drummer, were as apposite for faculty as for students. In my own case, what Thoreau said is literally true. If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. That's Thoreau speaking. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away." End quote. When I received a job offer from Dartmouth in 1990, I'd long been stepping to drummers from far away, in particular from Central Asia and Siberia. Here are some of them, shaman drummers who I befriended in South Siberia. When I met those drummers, I had dropped out of academe, was spending most of my time in remote parts of Tuva and Uzbekistan, and wasn't looking for a teaching position. But Dartmouth, and specifically the music department, extended a welcoming hand, seemed genuinely interested in my quirky research, and was willing to take on a no longer young assistant professor with a circuitous tr uh, career trajectory. I can't express strongly enough my feeling of good fortune and my gratitude to this institution for its willingness to take a certain measure of risk, both with the students and with the faculty it invites to be here. This may be one of the few arts and humanities talks in recent years whose title doesn't include a colon, a double entendre, or a neologistic plural noun form. <laughs> My plain Jane title augurs what I hope you'll find to be straightforward talk about a timely topic. My aim is to share with you some thoughts about how, why, and to whom music matters in an age of cultural globalization dominated by the ubiquitous impact of digital technology and commerce. In the 21st century, music is driven overwhelmingly by business and technology, and to a large extent, music has become a subsector of both. There has always been a circular relationship between music making as a creative practice and as a form of technology. That is, the creative search of musicians to realize the sonic worlds they hear in their imagination inspires innovations in techniques of sound production and reproduction in the form of new or improved musical instruments and sound making techniques. Musical instruments go back to the dawn of humanity and the earliest instruments might be viewed as examples of archaic technology that performs specific functions within hunter-gatherer societies. For example, hunting horns to lure animals or drums to call spirits or heal the sick. Music technology and music commerce have long been linked through the crucial role of taste and fashion. That is, sounds that appeal to what you could call a taste community create the potential for a market. Until the invention of audio recording, music could be transmitted, disseminated, and marketed in two ways. By transcribing it in some form of notation or tablature, or through live performance. But the invention of the phonograph toward the end of the 19th century was a landmark event infusing music technology and music commerce. The British composer Sir Arthur Sullivan, best known as the musical half of the theatrical partnership Gilbert and Sullivan, offered a trenchant observation about the two-edged sword of audio technology after hearing one of the first demonstrations of the phonograph, which Thomas Edison sent to London in 1888 to be introduced to London society. At the conclusion of the demonstration, Sullivan made a recording to be sent back to Edison in which he opined, quote, I can only say that I am astonished and somewhat terrified at the result of this evening's experiments, astonished at the wonderful power you have developed and terrified at the thought that so much hideous and bad music may be put on record forever, <laughs> end quote. Sullivan's prognostication was prescient. Though he couldn't have anticipated such exemplars of his terror as Top 40 Radio or New Age music, 
He clearly understood the potential of audio technology to shape musical taste and fashion for better and for worse. These days, the much discussed and debated impact of music technology seems paradoxical. On the one hand, the ubiquitous dissemination of music in mediated forms has distanced and depersonalized the relationship between music makers and music consumers. Mediated music is the soundscape of our daily lives, piped through unseen speakers or delivered directly to our inner ear through earbuds while we jog, work out, shop, or do homework. For many people, music serves as a performance enhancer, a kind of sonic steroid. It pumps us up as we do aerobics, focuses our mind while we study for an exam, the so-called Mozart effect, or makes us calmer when we're at the dentist's office to have a root canal. <laughs> Shakespeare's Food of Love, Kepler's Harmony of the Spheres, and Longfellow's Universal Language have become apps, ringtones, file sharing application, applications, and content for multinational entertainment conglomerates. At the same time, technology has democratized music making and empowered people with little or no formal music training to become music creators. Laptop orchestras like this one, which consists of students enrolled in the music department's course on digital musics, sonic arts, and the internet, shown here performing at the 2010 Arts Awards ceremony, develop students' ability to shape the dynamic, temporal, gestural, and spatial dimensions of sound by working with basic materials and processes of music making, such as timbre, texture, pattern, and pitch. You can see the orchestras being conducted by Professor Michael Casey over there on the left. Yet amid this exciting proliferation of creative voices and compositional sensibilities, there is reason to wonder what the future holds for the core effective, representational, communicative, and symbolic powers that have defined music and music making as one of the distinctive abilities and indeed pleasures of homo sapiens. Do these powers and pleasures still matter? And will they matter in the music of the future and to the music listeners of the future? My own answer, at least with regard to time present, is a resounding yes. And though I can't begin to imagine what music in time future might eventually sound like, there's a strong chance that the powers I mentioned a moment ago will remain at music's core. They will surely be produced, expressed, and disseminated with the help of new forms of music technology, perhaps in ways that deliver highly individualized, effective experiences. But for now, I want to return to time present and introduce you to some remarkable musicians from around the world who illustrate how and why music's core powers continue to matter. As a student of music and culture in various parts of Eurasia, I've been interested in the process through which particular musical voices come to represent or symbolize cultural values and social forces larger than themselves, especially at times of critical social or political transformation and upheaval. For a researcher, this process may appear largely mysterious, driven by idiosyncrasies of popular taste, the whims of fashion, and by an element of chance, sometimes expressed as being in the right place at the right time. Yet there's also a sense in which this process of representation and symbolization is amenable to cultural and social analysis carried out through ethnographic fieldwork. Whether by coincidence or by some kind of subconscious fatal attraction, the places where I've pursued fieldwork have provided plenty of opportunity to observe social transformation and upheaval. In the mid-1980s, I was living in Sarajevo and studying music in Bosnia. In the late 1980s and early 90s, I worked in Russia and Central Asia. Later, I did projects in Siberia and the Caucasus. Most recently, I've been working with musicians from Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, Western China, and the Middle East. I want to take you on a tour of some of the musical neighborhoods where I've worked and introduce you to their denizens. Some of them you may recognize, for all have a connection to Dartmouth. They've all been here, or in one case are just about to come here, to work with our students, perform in the Hopkins Center, or both. Each of them exemplifies a reason that music matters 
in a particular community and by extension in the world at large. Coming to Dartmouth, they've shared their sense of social commitment and their musical conscience. They've shown us, to paraphrase John Sloan Dickey, that the world's musical troubles are your troubles <laughs> and our troubles. None of them is a celebrity. None sells millions of CDs, fills stadiums, or monopolizes YouTube. But in each case, their own sustained efforts to master a particular language of art and become an innovator within it came to represent a higher purpose, whether in the service of social and moral aims, such as the right to self-representation and freedom of expression, or in the service of strengthening the bonds of community and promoting po post-conflict reconciliation, or in the pursuit of cultural pluralism, cosmopolitanism, and cross-cultural connectivity, essential ingredients of open and democratic societies. You might think of each of these individuals as illustrating what one could call a profile in musical courage. Their hopes and aspirations for their own art exemplify why music matters and will continue to matter to humanity long after music apps and file sharing have become obsolete. Let me begin with a musician named Dmitry Pokrovsky. I met Pokrovsky in 1986 in Moscow. One cold January night, I went to hear his small vocal ensemble perform a concert of traditional spiritual songs at the Andronikov Monastery, which had only recently been reopened as a museum to display icons by the great medieval painter Andrei Rublev. As I approached the building where the concert was to be held, I noticed, sil I noticed silent men in great coats and fur hats surrounding the entrance. They were KGB men. It was illegal then to give a public concert whose contents had not been vetted by the authorities, particularly one that included sacred music, and Dmitry Pokrovsky had on principle not followed the required procedure. The KGB men were there to intimidate both the performers and the audience. In the cultural topography of the Soviet Union, Pokrovsky and his ensemble were underground artists. Their subversive activity consisted of performing authentic traditional village music that they learned directly from old tradition bearers and villages. During most of the Soviet era, authentic Russian village music with its weird dissonances, body textual innuendos, and fervent religious, religious undertones was considered as ill-suited for the aesthetic and ethical development of Soviet citizens as the much maligned music of the avant-garde. Pokrovsky's commitment to presenting authentic Russian folklore was a direct challenge to the politicized aesthetics of the Soviet Union, which mandated that folk music uh, be represented through sanitized and bottlerized performances that some critics have referred to as fake lore. Let me show you what I mean by fake lore. Here's an excerpt from a video of a state-sponsored Russian folk music ensemble that is included in a video anthology released by the Japanese electronics company JVC in the late 1980s called the JVC Video Anthology of World Music and Dance. The performance was originally filmed for broadcast on Soviet television and you'll see a subtitle in Russian that identifies the ensemble. And now for contrast, here's an excerpt from a song performed by the Dmitry Pokrovsky Ensemble, which appeared on a recording I co-produced in Moscow in 1988. Uh, the solo voice at the beginning is Pokrovsky himself. <laughs> Baby. 
I trust that you can hear the difference between the two performance styles. Back in 92, when Pokrovsky co-taught a course on Russian music with me, he spent almost the entire term trying to teach that song to our class. It may seem surprising that music, and in particular folk music, uh, would be cast as a dissonant art form. In the heyday of the Soviet dissident movement, it was principally writers, visual artists, and dancers who made headlines in the West as their books were banned and their exhibitions closed down or bulldozed. These days, news about artists who run afoul of government censors more often than not emanates from China. Less publicized but no less insidious suppression of artistic freedom is rampant in countries such as Belarus, Uzbekistan, Iran, Burma, and many others. The victims are typically visual artists, theater directors, filmmakers, or writers. We don't hear much about musicians. How can music express dissent since while music may be narrative or mimetic in its representation of reality, most music resists unambiguous interpretations of semantic meaning, and even the meaning of evidently symbolic gestures in music is often hotly contested. To be clear, I am speaking here of music itself, not of musical lyrics. In the case of Dmitry Pokrovsky, his music got him into trouble not because he set out to challenge the Soviet political system, either overtly or through some kind of Aesopian musical language, as, for example, has been claimed in the case of Dmitry Shostakovich, about which my colleague Steve Swain spoke to the incoming class a few years back. Rather, in a country where music had so often been forced to be more than itself, to assume a purpose beyond the aesthetic that cast musicians as the victim handmaiden or shill of politicians and bureaucrats, Dmitry Pokrovsky fought to have his music appreciated and judged, not through the prism of politics, but simply as music, and at that not even as Russian music, which he regarded as an artificial nationalist construct, but as music from Pskov or Belgorod or Smolensk. Pokrovsky challenged the very politicization of art in the Soviet Union. His steadfast commitment to seeking out the unheard voices of Russia's villages provided Russians with a sense of their own past from which they had largely been cut off during the decades of Soviet rule. At the height of the political tipping point of the late 1980s, when the already irreversible momentum of perestroika and glasnost adumbrated the impending breakup of the Soviet Union, the government at last also recognized Pokrovsky's achievement by awarding him the state prize, the country's second most prestigious award for achievements in the arts and sciences, and in a ceremony in the Kremlin, uh, which I was privileged to attend, he received that award. Dmitry Pokrovsky's music mattered tremendously in Russia at a time of transformational political and social change. Pokrovsky died in 1996 of a ruptured aorta. He was 52 years old, but his ensemble continues on, it was in the Hopkins Center in 1994 that the Pokrovsky Ensemble premiered their startlingly revisionist production of the composer Igor Stravinsky's masterwork, Les Nos, The Wedding, a production that continues to be performed today in prestigious concert venues around the world. Around the same time that I first met Dmitry Pokrovsky in the mid-1980s, I was also conspiring to travel to a part of the Soviet Union that had aroused considerable curiosity in the West, but that was diplomatically closed to foreigners from what were then called in the Soviet political lexicon, capitalist countries. In both the Soviet Union and the United States, diplomatically closed regions were part of the kooky quid pro quo of the Cold War. Soviets, for example, were prohibited from traveling to Brooklyn because of the ostensible sensitivity of the Brooklyn Naval Yard, although they were free to visit Manhattan and Queens. <laughs> the off-limits destination that interested me was Tuva, a small autonomous region in South Siberia, and the specific object of my interest was the musical practice known in English as throat singing, in which a singer, a single singer, can produce two or more pitches simultaneously by selectively amplifying harmonics or overtones that are naturally present in the voice. 
Through connections I'd made in Moscow, I was able to cut through the red tape that barred capitalist foreigners from traveling to Tuva. And on assignment from National Geographic magazine, I went there in 1987 to study and record throat singing, thus becoming the second American to be allowed to conduct field research in Tuva. My predecessor, the biologist Catherine Wynne Edwards, had gone there a year earlier to study the mating behavior of the Siberian dwarf hamster. <laughs> Tuva had its own version of fake lore in the form of European-style music ensembles that performed staged choral arrangements of Tuvan songs, which in their traditional form were always performed by a single singer. Here are some photos of such ensembles taken during my 1987 expedition. Tuvan fake lore was in fact doubly fake. It was fake not only in the sense of the sanitized and choreographed Russian ensemble uh, that I showed you a few minutes ago. It was also fake because it imposed a russified European musical aesthetic on the expressive culture of a small, non-European indigenous people. Not only Tuva's music, but its language, culture, and traditional economy were endangered by russification, which in Stalin's Russia also meant collectivization. Tuvans were nomads, or as it's now fashionable to call them, mobile pastoralists. And for Soviet economic planners, mobile pastoralism was an economic dead end. Tuvans were resettled into hastily built villages, and economic planners developed strategies to transform herders into farmers and factory workers. Here's one of those villages that I visited. As the Soviet Union broke apart, young musicians in Tuva dared to challenge the hegemony of the Soviet cultural model that had cast Tuvan music as a kind of ersatz Russian choral tradition. One of the small independent ensembles that emerged from this nativist movement was called Hunhertu. The four members of Hunhertu were all master throat singers, and when I brought them to Dartmouth in 1992, their music was an immediate sensation, here as well as elsewhere in the United States. They've since returned to Dartmouth many times and have a loyal fan base in the Upper Valley. Throat singing is indeed an, in an interesting technique from the perspective of both physiology and acoustics. Around a dozen years ago, I co-authored a Scientific American article that includes images of the singer's vocal cords made with video endoscopy while they were singing. I won't take time to show that now, but if you're interested, you can look at the article. During the years that, I, that followed my first visit to Tuva, I worked with Hunhertu to reconstruct older forms of Tuvan music and make them available through recordings and concert tours. This was not a straightforward assignment since unlike most music, which is created with the expectation that it will be heard by human ears, throat singing traditionally had no audience. Rather, it was directed toward the spirit world as an offering to particular spirits that are believed to inhabit natural phenomena such as water, mountains, birds and animals. The spiritual power of throat singing lies in a singer's ability to represent the natural world through what I call sound mimesis. Here's an example of one member of the ensemble Hunhertu making an offering to the spirit of water flowing in a stream by imitating its sound through an onomatopoeic technique called barbang nadir, which in Tuvan means rolling. In other words, the singer uses his exquisite control of amplified harmonics to make a rolling sound that imaginatively imitates and fuses with the roiling sound of water in the stream. You'll see this video excerpt. Please excuse my uh, amateur handheld technique. I never took a film course here. <laughs> Oh, 
If you can imagine yourself as the water spirit that inhabits that stream, you'd be hard pressed to remain indifferent after such a performance. It's a little like karaoke, with the water providing the soundtrack into which the soloist inserts his voice. And like karaoke, throat singing didn't develop as an activity of professional artists, but of amateurs. The principles of a rough and ready empiricism, trial and error experimentation to find out what works, followed by refinement of an individual style, are hallmarks of many artistic traditions. What distinguishes a dilettante from an expert artist is the ingenuity of the experiments, the tenacity of the experimenter, and an aesthetic sensibility able to distinguish dross from gold. Fortunately for Tuvan music, my friends and ensemble Hunhertu turned out to be consummate experts, and their voices have literally been heard around the world. These days, I find that many of my students have encountered throat singing in their high school physics class, or heard it in a movie soundtrack or pop song. For me, Tuvan music, like the episode you just heard, has radically reconfigured the way I listen, both in what I listen to and what I listen for. I'm more attuned to the sounds of the natural world and to the timbral richness of those sounds. In any event, what's significant for Tuvans is that throat singing has catapulted a tiny land in Siberia into the global cultural marketplace and branded it with a distinctive voice. Indeed, it's safe to say that music is Tuva's most successful export product. Pride in this success has helped to strengthen social cohesion and provide Tuvans with a glimmer of hope amid the degradation of other quality of life indicators that has taken a devastating toll on indigenous Siberian peoples in the two decades since the breakup of the Soviet Union. The worldwide, su worldwide success of Tuvan music raises interesting questions about the extent to which effective or symbolic powers that may be felt acutely by a particular group of listeners can translate across cultures. In other words, is music destined to matter only to an audience sensitized to the style, syntax, and semantics of its particular musical language? Or can music transcend cultural difference? Based on my own observations, my answer is both yes and no. It seems that some music is easier to export than others. Tuvan music is at one extreme of this continuum of exportability, perhaps the language of harmonics with their low integer frequency ratios strikes a universal chord, so to speak, or perhaps it's that the effective qualities of Tuvan music touch something primal in all of us. Other kinds of music present more of a challenge to the would-be exporter or transcultural bridge builder. I've worked on and off in both capacities, and one of the musical traditions I've trafficked in for quite a few years is the indigenous classical music of Azerbaijan, which is called Muham. The best known exponent of this tradition is a man named Alim Qasimov, uh, whom the New York Times music critic John Perellis recently called simply one of the greatest singers alive. I first brought Alim to the United States in 1988 to appear at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, and we've been friends and accomplices ever since. Two winters ago, Alim, his daughter Fergana, who you see on the right in the photo, and Alim's four-man four ensemble came to Dartmouth to visit my classes and to give a Hopkins Center concert. Here's a little clip of Alim and Fergana rehearsing a performance of Muham. The clip is from a documentary that I co-produced and was filmed in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, where Alim and Fergana Kasimov both live.
Alim is what I would call an innovator in tradition. He's constantly searching for ways both to expand and transcend the boundaries of Azerbaijani Muram music. Over the years, I've spent a lot of time traveling with him, and during our time together, I've noticed that he's always working at his music, singing softly to himself, tapping out rhythms with his fingers, listening to a recording of the previous night's concert. The inner freedom that he evokes in his music comes from lots of hard work and practice, as well as from an exceptional native talent. To be a musician, there has to be a fire burning in you, Alim told me once. It's either there or it isn't. Alim's spirit of musical adventure and willingness to take artistic risks has made him an ideal collaborator in the work of a small non-governmental organization called the Aka Khan Music Initiative, with which I've been associated as a consultant, curator, and producer for the last 10 years. The Music Initiative is a program of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, which is an agency of the Aga Khan Development Network, or AKDN. That's our website page up there. Uh, the AKDN, founded and guided by the Aga Khan, the <laughs> spiritual leader of the Shia Imami Ismaili Muslims, is a contemporary endeavor of the Ismaili Imamate to, quote, realize the social conscience of Islam through institutional action, end quote, as the AKDN describes its mandate. The development agencies that comprise the AKDN work in the domains of health, education, architecture, culture, microfinance, rural development, disaster reduction, promotion of private sector enterprise, and revitalization of historic cities in some of the most impoverished and underserved regions of Africa and Asia. The crucial idea behind the AKDN is that the social impact of development is maximized when social, economic, and cultural initiatives are interconnected and carried out cooperatively in accordance with a comprehensive and long-range strategic plan. For an interregional cultural development initiative whose aim is to strengthen cultural pluralism and cosmopolitanism, Alim Kasimov's performances of Muram hold great value. On the one hand, the power of these performances makes it easy to understand why another culture's music matters so much to those who cherish it. Perhaps more importantly, Kasimov's music makes a strong case for Muram as a great art form that transcends its cultural roots and can touch anyone who is open to it. As the philosopher Anthony Appiah reminds us in his book, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, quote, the connection people feel to cultural objects that are symbolically theirs because they were produced from within a world of meaning created by their ancestors. The connection to art through identity is powerful. It should be acknowledged. The cosmopolitan, though, wants to remind us of other connections. One connection, the one neglected in talk of cultural patrimony, is the connection not through identity, but despite difference. We can respond to art that is not ours. Indeed, we can fully respond to our art only if we move beyond thinking of it as ours and start to respond to it as art." End quote. One of the strategies we've used in the Aga Khan Music Initiative to build musical cosmopolitanism is to create projects wherein musicians from Central Asia, the Middle East, and South Asia come together both with one another and with musicians from Europe and North America to explore how to create new cosmopolitan languages of art. These have been exciting experiments, full of energy, goodwill, and invariably a certain amount of vexation. I want to share with you now a glimpse of one collaboration in which I participated as a kind of musical matchmaker between Alim Kasimov and the Kronos Quartet, which has also performed at Dartmouth quite a few times over the years. Kronos is based in San Francisco and performs only music by living or recently living composers and performers. To launch the Kronos Kasimov collaboration, Alim Kasimov and two members of his ensemble traveled from Baku to San Francisco to rehearse a set of Azerbaijani songs drawn from Kasimov's repertoire. The challenge of the week-long rehearsal period was to create a seamless interface 
between the note-reading Kronos players and the Kasimov Ensemble, whose performances typically feature an ever-shifting blend of memorized and extemporized musical gestures. The following video clip, an excerpt from a documentary film about the collaboration that I co-produced, offers a glimpse of the five-day rehearsal period during which the members of Kronos work with Alim Kasimov and two members of his ensemble to arrange six Azerbaijani songs. He'll, he'll show you. Why don't you start from the beginning? Explorations of artistic hybridity, like the work of Alim Kasimov and Kronos Quartet, represent one good way to create contemporary work rooted in, but not constrained by, traditional models. That is, work that one might call tradition-based, rather than traditional. Hybrid work that mixes up cultural categories and artistic genres, challenges the linearity and canonicity often promulgated by constructions of national cultural heritage. Though the East-West collaboration represented by the work of Alim Kasimov and the Kronos Quartet may appear on the surface like a retake of the Soviet-era Europeanization of indigenous music that I spoke of earlier, ours is a collaboration conceived and conducted on a level playing field where the players meet one another halfway. For the architects of such collaborations, a key question is whether traditions such as Azerbaijani Muham can become cosmopolitanized 
without losing the essential quality of connection to a local spiritual source that makes them powerful? Even if the answer is yes, it's not always easy for the artists. Back in Azerbaijan, Alim Kasimov, whose performances of Muham in a more tradition-bound style made him a popular idol, has had to endure criticism that he sold out, made a mockery of Muham, and sacrificed good taste in the interest of achieving celebrity in the West. But criticism notwithstanding, Kasimov remains a committed experimentalist and musical cosmopolitan in a domestic environment that is increasingly edging towards embrace of strong ethno-nationalism, now amply fueled by new oil wealth spewing from the bottom of the Caspian Sea. Another artist who's been part of the Aga Khan Music Initiative's Kronos Quartet project is a remarkable young musician from Afghanistan named Humayun Sahi, who is a master performer of the Afghan Rabab. Humayun hasn't yet been to Dartmouth, but if his plane is on time, he should be arriving here in about three hours. <laughs> I hope you've seen the posters up around campus announcing his concert on Thursday uh, night at Collis Common Ground, where he'll perform a concert of raga music from Afghanistan and India, uh, together with the distinguished uh, Sarod player, Ken Zuckerman, and tabla master, Salar Nadir. Though Humayun presently resides in the thriving Afghan emigre community of Fremont, California, he's coming now more or less directly from Kabul, where he's been working to help restore and revitalize musical traditions that were heavily controlled, censored, repressed, and finally totally banned during the years of Taliban rule. In his 2001 report, Can You Stop the Birds Singing? The Censorship of Music in Afghanistan, the ethnomusicologist John Bailey described the extreme and possibly unique conditions of a society deprived of music. Quote, there is a total proscription of all musical activity other than certain forms of unaccompanied religious recitation and singing, Bailey wrote. Bailey goes on to describe how under the Taliban, quote, all musical instruments were banned and when discovered by agents of the Office for, uh, for the Propagation of Virtue and the prevention of vice were destroyed, sometimes being burnt, burnt in public, along with confiscated audio cassettes, TV sets, and VCRs, end quote. As The Guardian reported in 1998, young Talibs, quote, hung television sets from lampposts in mock executions and ripped the innards out of video and audio cassettes, putting the disemboweled casings on display, end quote. Unable to earn a living, Musicians were forced to leave Afghanistan. Many of them, including Humayun Sahi, went to Pakistan, where they lived in refugee camps not far from the border of Afghanistan, near the city of Peshawar. For musicians, however, conditions in the camps were little better than in Afghanistan, for the camps were connected to the various Mujahideen parties and were under the control of mullahs, who also banned any form of music making or listening. In an interview I did with Humayun Sahi in 2005 for the booklet notes of a CD, he recounted how he continued to spend hours a day practicing the rubab as a refugee, playing as quietly as he could in his tent so that no one would hear him while he worked to perfect the new style of rubab playing that he heard in his head and that would form the basis for an innovative approach to playing the instrument. Later, he moved out of the refugee camp and was able to establish a small music school in Peshawar, where he also found work performing at weddings. From Peshawar, he immigrated to the United States. When I met him in early 2002, he had recently arrived in Fremont, California. Listening to Humayun then, I immediately understood that I was in the presence of a master. In the decade since our first meeting, I produced three CDs of Humayun, one of them with the Kronos Quartet, which features a piece that Humayun composed for Afghan rabab, percussion, and string quartet. Amid a busy performance schedule that takes him to concert halls around the world, Humayun finds time to return to Kabul, where he mentors young music students and gives concerts. He has also become an important figure in the Afghan diaspora, helping to provide social cohesion, maintain cultural identity, and promote therapeutic reconciliation among the factious clans and ethno-linguistic groups that comprise the diaspora, 
Here is a brief video clip of Humayun at a community event in Fremont. It's excerpted from a documentary film I produced for the CD DVD Humayun Sahi, The Art of the Afghan Rabab. All of the musicians I've spoken about this afternoon have struggled against obstacles that threaten to compromise or void their ability to make their music matter in the ways that mattered most to them. In doing so, they exhibited courage, tenacity, and ingenuity. Their music may or may not touch you personally, but at one point or another, it has mattered deeply to some community, both for the beliefs and values it has represented or symbolized, and for its immediate affecting power. And while all of the musicians I've spoken about are firmly rooted in a specific cultural tradition, they are working to make their music relevant in a post-traditional world. In the context of pluralist modernity, an individual's embrace of transmitted practices or beliefs ought to represent a choice, not a necessity beholden to lineage, caste, religion, ethnicity, or other inherited social markers. More specifically, in the domain of music, Tradition as a system of transmitted formal and stylistic constraints ought to become simply one among many possible sources for creativity and imagination, for imagining the world differently. This is as true of the tradition of Western classical music as any other. One of the truly exciting developments of our era of cultural globalization has been the opportunity for musicians immersed in the language of classical music to expand their musical worldview through sustained contact with other musical traditions. This contact has enlivened classical music, expanded its audience, and perhaps served as something of a corrective to the erstwhile orientalizing tendencies of classical music that it is now fashionable to denounce. At the same time, intercultural music making illuminates both the potential and the limits of music's ability to reach across conventions of style and idiom to touch us. I hope that we humans will continue to savor the power that music seems to have over us, even as we increasingly demystify the neural mechanisms, perceptual pathways, and psychoacoustic processes that shape our response to it. For in the end, what I most cherish, both about making music and listening to it in live performance, is the mysterious advent sometimes in a moment of repose, and sometimes in a moment of heightened attention, of a frisson, a chill, or a sudden welling up of tears that is the physical manifestation of awe, wonder, or exhilaration. Such responses, whatever the musical language that delivers them, are a birthright of all humans. Indeed, responding to music humanizes us and reaffirms why music matters. Thank you.